Ko tararua ngā paumaunga, uh, ki otaki te awa, uh, ko te moana o Raukawa, uh, ki kāpiti, um, ko kāpiti te mautiri o ngā mātou tūpuna. Uh, ko te pau o tainui e tu uh, tonu nei, uh, he uri o Ngāti Kapu Manua Whiti, uh, he uri hoki o Ngāti Raukawa rau ki te tonga. Um, tēnei te mihi, tēnei te mihi nui ki a, ki a koutou. Growing up, I was born in Lower Hutt, at Lower Hutt Hospital, and um, I, my earliest, absolute earliest memories was the excitement I felt in, you know, climbing into our small waka. Um, we were a family of seven, so um, I just have this absolute memory of, of going to Otaki. I was like, we're going to Otaki, and um, I was the second born, so I think I, you know, was fairly privileged in the sense that I got to go to Otaki at the drop of a hat with my dad. Um, my dad was raised by his karaua, um, by my great grandfather, and so he was raised in a house. My great grandfather had um, eighteen tamariki, and so he was raised in Hacker's Castle, and. On the way to Otaki, it used to take a, you know, it was only probably an hour and a bit over the Pawatahanui Hills, but it just seemed, it was the journey of going to Otaki and the stories that we would be telling. And I, I, I think I sensed there the huge heart that my dad had for his Tūranga Waiwai. And so it was really normal. Coming to Otaki was, a, was almost a weekly experience. The only thing that stopped us coming first thing Saturday morning or Friday night was Dad played rugby. And so coming to, you know, coming to Otaki, the journey over the hills, it was a slow road back then, and Dad would tell me all the stories. And I would just, that was it. I, I imagined this thriving community that he'd been brought up in where, you know, they roamed. They roamed, as a little boy, he roamed with all his cousins. They roamed, um, this was the township, you know, um, to Pauotainui or the pa, as it was known there. They roamed from the pa through Waiorumai, our puna, our, one of our lakes, out to the beach. They did it on horseback, they did it barefoot. And I'm talking about, you know, I'm talking about nohi nohi. I'm talking about five, four, three-year-olds running wild, but the the kōrero he always told us was this was our town and we were safe you know they would be told they would be fed wherever they were they went from house to house there was you know there was Hacker's Castle, Rickyville like it was a connected community and these little urchins <laughs> they called themselves the original street kids you know they had the run of the mm. town and you know my queer his mother Bonnie she um you know, she was working at one or two of the the pubs here and cooked for them and, and cleaned, but she was also part of a whānau that sung. And so, you know, the the whole, when I was growing up, Ōtaki to me was a place of love, of kai, of being nurtured, didn't matter whose house you were in, you were always fed, you were always looked after, and song, singing. You know, there was, every house had a piano everyone's son um, and so yeah that's journeying as a little kid coming up here was just I couldn't wait till my feet touched the ground and it was always at one of the auntie's houses and you know the marae our marae you know raukua marae our matua marae te pau o tainui they were they were sacred places for you know as a little kid I remember them being like that's where you went for tangihanga and that was to me was just I think my eyes must have been on stalks every time I went into the whare as a little kid because like, that's where I saw the same people, these people that loved us and, you know, really loved us. You, they were, all, you were always being grabbed, you know, and cuddled and kissed. And that question of, which one are you? <laughs> who, who do you belong to? You know, from the ones that maybe, had, you know, were a little bit more distant. But to have like a hundred aunties and a hundred uncles was kind of how it felt. And then those times when we had, um, you know, we had tangihanga, you know, the solemnity that went on, the kawa that happened, um, again, the singing, uh, the kai, and the whole thing of, you know, watching all my cousins, older cousins, prepping the kai. I mean, back then we still had, um, we didn't have a covered uh, kota or, or cookhouse for the men. I remember the tripod fire and the big pots 
and them having to like, oh, I remember them slaughtering the puaka on the side of the old uh, cookhouse. You know, these things are like, I can see them and I can smell them. And I mean, the biggest excitement for us kids, because we always shooed away, all us kids, like a tribe of us, was to go up to the top of Pukikaraka and ride down with the big kids on the um, car, you know, the car bonnets. Um, right down and crash into those there was a you know line of pine trees oh that was so exciting <laughs> that was so and then haul it back up the top again you know that's right next to our urupa but you know are those memories of um, being part of a really loving and connecting connected community was what I lived for and then you know when we were about 11 or 12 my parents uh, my mother got another teaching job in, in Kirikiriroa and we moved and that was I just remember my father's face, you know. Um, he knew he had to move. They knew they had to go and, you know, do this mahi. And, but that really ripped um, him away from, you know, the, the proximity of, of Wellington, Pōneki to Otaki. But even so, the drop of a hat would be in the car. But, you know, my other siblings, you know, that was a hoha like for most of them. They were younger. They were like, I'm not getting in the car. For, well, they didn't have a choice. But Dad... He, the phone would ring late at night. I'd be like, is it, you know, not saying is it a tangi hunger, but is it, are we going? And then I, you know, would be in the car. And, and it got to a point where it was quite often Dad and I, and I'd be like a moorpork on the, in the car watching for the possums, you know, and we would drive down here. Um, so that's kind of, for me, um, like I said, all my life I, I, I loved the, not the idea of my tūranga waiwai, but that this was my place and that I was welcome here and that it was loving and, and receiving. Well, I view this queer here, <laughs> and this is why she's on my wall, as being the tino, um, uh visionary, I think, for our whānau, um, and that is Meriruia. Mm. So that's Meriruia Hakaraya, also known as um, Meriruia Bevan or Mary Bevan. And she was one of the original signatories um, to the petition that led uh, women in this country to be given the vote. Um, she was also, uh, her and her sister were um, kai rungoa on Kapiti in the time of Taraparaha, you know, and they knew about the Treaty of Waitangi and because it came to the Motiri and they were advisors to that part of it too, as only small younger children really, mm -hmm. but they were very smart and shrewd and she was a business owner here in Otaki, so she owned um, a couple of the pubs, but they were lodging houses more than pubs in there, because she was a leader in the temperance movement. So when I look at her and then I look at the line of, um, of women that span not you know just my hakaraya whanau, but all of our peka, all of our branches that affiliate to, um, to firstly to kapu and to also to raukawa, raukawa and our other three hapu and ōtaki. It's littered, littered with strong um, wahine that actually um, respond and are willing to work together to come up with a plan to not only tackle um, some of the pressures and, and, and again the inequities that, that government agencies bring to bear, but they're actually more interested in going around the outside of that and getting it done. <laughs> you know, they're, they are ringa ropa. They're not afraid to roll their sleeves up. So um, am I a strategist? I think I am part of a group of women. We've had to, um, in our whānau, where we go, this needs to be sorted. And then we work to our strengths, because it's actually not, my strength is not um, necessarily going to improve something I have no idea about and I'm not going to put myself in the way so you know I'll get out of the way and let the work happen and I'll come in behind we, we're really good at backing each other up I think that's a generational thing I think that that's one of the things that we saw that happen as a natural course of action um, from our grandmothers and our great aunties because they were much more connected but as we've become a little bit more isolated in our own um, you know, and our whanos have all grown, you know, I can see that now we, we, we have to span across um, almost at, again, back to hapu level ways of interacting. 
And if that, what I mean by that is it's not like you've got the same five people making decisions anymore. There's actually a whole nother, and we've all got our strengths. Yeah, which I think um, enables us to get stuff done. Our te ao marama and a red. I mean, it's that's what excites me. When the phone rings, or we send out an application for you know uh, for funding for filmmaking, or you know when that phone call happens, or one of these that I'm going to take come up and go, guess what? You know, it's that's what I mean about expanding, always expanding our um, horizons. You know, yesterday one of them came up to me and said. Um, Hey, look, there's a, a storytellers, um, world and storytellers uh, hui in Vancouver in September. Do you think I should apply for us? You know, off the bat, she's like, we should go there and tell our story. Mm. I mean, that just makes my heart sing because, you know, they are part of the, they understand. Mm. They understand what we're doing and what we need to say to the world. Um, and that's fantastic. The other thing I realised is in terms of um, succession planning, which is always something that people talk about, um, you know, I have the same crew that were with me when we started 10 years ago. Um, the other day I said to one of our rangatahi, tahi, you know, I said, oh, well, you've been coming up for three years, wouldn't you? Because I've been here five. And then I went, so that means you've been here four, and, you know, and, 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 and most of them have been here for that long, and none of them want to leave. So, you know, we must be, we all must be passionate and doing it and enjoying it, and we've got lots more to do. It wasn't until I got to about 17, 18 and I entered um, the world of um, broadcasting then which was, I worked in commercial radio in Hamilton, I left school. That's probably around the time that I actually, it, it, I saw another part of the world that I, well I saw through the eyes or through the attitudes of other people that that's not the world they saw at all. You see I grew up thinking there were two types of Māori, by the time I got to my teenage years there were two types of Māori, I'd kind of figured it out, it was easier to figure it out this way. They're all the bad Māori that you heard about in the media and that people used to, you know, say ugly things about and they would and they, I would hear them or they would say them to me about, oh, bloody Māori's are useless and all this sort of stuff, yeah? And there was my whānau, who were the good Māori's and the loving Māori's and nothing to do with whatever was going on that was, you know. So when I entered broadcasting, that's when I came up close to just how polarised and racist and like these deeply ingrained, um, ignorant attitudes towards Māori. And at the same time, I started to see that, um, you know, the, the very, very clear um, injustices and inequalities that Māori were, were experiencing. And it was like, it was a shock. It was a shock to my system, really, that, um, you know, like I said, I didn't see those attitudes here. I don't think I ever, when I was growing up, ever heard any of my uncles and aunties um, put, put Pākehā down. If anything, what they did was say, these are our partners. These Pākehā in this town, we're, we're a bi you know, almost as generous to say we are a bicultural town. Mm. We have a shared history. We have a shared story. Mm. And so when I started to question that, like, why are you so loving? Because that, to me, the rest of this country is piling on Ōtaki, because then I started hearing things like, oh, Māori town, you know, if you said, I, you know, I'm from Ōtaki, Ōtaki, Māori town. Mm -hmm. And they made all these disparaging comments about Ōtaki. I never heard it the other way around. I never heard any of our aunties go, oh, those useless Pākehā. They weren't like that. And that goes back to our, our hitori, the story of, you know, we, we have, we have, and I believe we still, we do still have this, but in my, in our queer's time, they had mana in this town. 
you know. So they never put themselves down. They never saw themselves as second rate, second class. They might not have had the flashest of anything, but to them it was about manaki, uh, kotahitanga, you know, aroha for the people, and some of that aligned with their katarika or their, um, you know, mihanari uh, pono, whakapono, but they, they practiced it. They weren't, you know, they didn't have two faces or, you know, two ways of looking at the world. They had one way of looking at the world and they expressed those tikanga. And it goes back to the time when, you know, there was a, there was a time here um, when we are the kingitanga, part of the kingitanga, the southernmost post, when, you know, there were, um, the wars had had such an effect and, had, and, and the ongoing injustices across our country especially you know we were very aware of that from Waikato to Taranaki and we had allegiances with these people and so when the call came out to rise up against the crown forces you know it was our leaders of that time who said no you know we will protect the Pākehā in this community you know so that's mana and that that's what I mean we I grew up in a place that that saw itself as being manaful you know, where everybody else started to describe us as living in somewhat deprivation. Mm. You know, and so we find ourselves, you know, I find myself having lived through that and seeing what we have done as a people here in, in Ōtaki because of the vision of our kaumātua kuia, because of whakatūpurana ruamana, that vision that we will reclaim and rejuvenate and, and stand in, in our own real and in our own tikanga, I've seen not only Pākehā having to kind of acknowledge that, or even if they don't, they're aware of it, but I've seen iwi Māori acknowledge that. So, you know, we have come, I think, from a place where we needed the next tools in the toolbox, because we are strategists, and now we find, and to see that change um, in my lifetime, that's been hugely inspirational, and I feel really privileged. Mm. started off in um, the pilot for National Iwi Radio, you know, I was the yeah. news um, editor for that. And those, that moi moia back then was that across the country we would have, um, Iwi would own their own radio station and then be able to disseminate their own news, cover their own news, um, create a repository of their own storyteller songs, you know, all that matauranga. And then over time, the capacity build of that would allow, you know, us to retain our own um, regional aiwi ahapu stories. But over time, that's been controlled by funding, whether it's to Mangai Paho or other funding, it's been controlled. And I don't mean controlled in a necessarily in an overlord sort of way, but it has been, it's affected the growth of iwi radio. Mm. And so now we find us, then we, we, then we turned our attention to um, Whakata Māori, Māori TV, and that was a really exciting time. We fought really hard for that. Um, but that absolutely, um, as soon as it was set up almost, became the, those that were in control of uh, Māori television back in the day almost adopted um, a Pākehā way of doing things. Yeah. And what that did was it actually, in a structure, and then managed how the funding was going to go to program makers. And so we did about 15, 12 years of creating, um, you know, television programs on, on this, you know, on a quarter of the funding that Parkia producers got for creating television for TVNZ. It's the same product. It's exactly the same thing. We just got to do it for less. And we were... We were prepared to do it to begin with because we had eye on the ball we were going to capacity build. But I'm, you know, a lot of us are very disappointed and very disenchanted with that model. And that's what I'm saying. I think that the strength of doing it in your own, um, within your own community and then building it, not because of the money, but building it because you're building the passion and the energy and not being idealistic about it because we've had to do all this pretty much ourselves, um, but it gives you that, that rangatiratanga. We're not governed by a, 
you know, those from the outside. We're only we were we're self governing within our own hapu. So that's a strategy. We yeah. our strategy was we need to own the screen so that we can put up those stories. We need to um, ensure that everything we do um, is based on our tikanga here in our rohi in our hapuri. What are those important tikanga? And we've got you know we're we're really fortunate to have Tuana Waraikua, um help us in terms of, and I don't mean help us, you know, on a daily, but, you know, we look to them for the inspiration that comes from Whakatupurana Ruamana Mano and the Tintanga, and then we call them the Tintanga, but what tikanga, we, we asked us, is what is the most important tikanga do we have as Uri of this Hapuri, and it's Manaki. So what I mean is that um, I'm I'm one of a lot of there's a lot of us, okay. but in terms of having a rotaki for Māori land, yeah, we started with a rotaki and we're very clear on that. But our rotaki sits alongside Whaka, sorry, sits within Fakatupurana Ruamano, okay. and is and has been acknowledged as being part of that because the the I how the strategy or the Fakatupurana Ruamano rotaki. Uh, it looks at the survival of Māori, especially here in this community as a people, and it looked at all of the things that we needed to um, reclaim. And one of them was about how we disseminate our stories to the world. Mm. So Uncle Fata um, Ma were really clear about that, so that's why in later years they went and uh, made a claim to the tri uh, tri tribunal, Waitangi Tribunal, for the airwaves, for the airwaves. In other words, you know, the, the government, through legislation, um, decided regionally who would be given what they called back then the terrestrial rights for broadcasting. And that's the old towers, when they used to have towers up on all the hills. And one was given to Rokua, and it goes as far as from here all the way down to Pōneki. Now, the government of the day, which is, you know, we're talking back in the 80s, had intent really to control all of that because that's what the radio, this is what the radio frequencies were set up to do. But you see, Māori came in around the edges and said, no, Māori want to be able to tell these stories and to have control over how those stories are, are picked up. So, you know, that's a strategy mm. because then they were able to say, you know, Māori have a right under the Treaty of Waitangi to um, to exercise tenoranga teratanga over this. It's a resource, you know. So, so that's all been pretty much. Um, now we've gone digital, of course, and those uh, frequencies are still enshrined in, in um, law and legislation. Um, but you know, I'm talking to to those various, you know, those people that have been involved in that mahi for the last 40 years and saying you know we'll support what you're doing over here but at the same time using the digital frequencies you know yes we will strategize because the 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 kaupapa is still the same we need to get our stories um to ourselves in order to understand ourselves and if there's 350 million indigenous people um who currently identify as indigenous and that's only like a a fraction of, of the people that are indigenous in the world, then we've got an amazing um, global audience right there. Mm -hmm. And so what we've found by telling our own stories, owning the screen screens uh, at the Māori and Film Festival, is we've once again showed that we don't need to go through the system of, you know, broadcasters signing off, editors deciding what how we should tell our stories. But you know, this was a massive building. It used to be a, um, the biggest department store in this region and across to the wider upper. So it was like, you know, oh, I thought that's a great idea, but no, nah, we can't do it. Um, and then, you know, I, we were peering through the windows and it was full of dust and, you know, old shop wear. And, and this old man came to the door and he said, can, you know, can I help you? And, and here's the thing, you know, when I was growing up, we were we only ever came in here very rarely because it was very posh. It was mm -hmm. a very posh store. But our aunties worked in it, you know, so they're like, oh, lovely to see 
you and you'd be like, oh, you know, can't be in here, it's, it's for posh people sort of thing. But um, the old man that came to the door was Mr. Ed House. And, you know, he'd grown up in this, he'd been born in this, in this building, worked his whole life in this building, met his wife in this building when he was 16, had all their children. I mean, it was, you know, it's a family legacy. But one of the things that my dad used to tell me was his grandfather would bring him here once a year his grandfather would put his best horse racing suit on and come in with his dad and and he would say Mr. Ed House, Mr. Ed House and Mr. Ed House would go Mr. Hakurai and then dad, uh, my grandfather would say shoes for the boy and dad would get once a year one good set of clothes which he would then wear out but that was and then it was all on tick and when I was speaking to Mr. Ed House about that that was you know his his father was the man who put everything well he started telling me stories about how most of the community was on tick and they would take a year to pay it off it was in the days before lay by would just go on a book mm. and i thought that there's a connection here there's a really good little connection here so i remember talking to old mr ed house about that and then he started telling me stories about all the naughty boys that used to climb in here and steal the Levi jeans. And, and all of these stories he told about the, you know, the various people that had worked for him, with him, around him. And there wasn't, there wasn't an inkling of malice when he told those stories. He told them because he was a member of this community. He knew all the families. Mm. And that something in me, I just went, this may actually work. So I told him what our our dream was, which was to, to return to a whakaro that had been set and why, and why we called Māori Land Māori Land was because I'd watched a film about the funeral in Tangi of um, Hene today, who was Taroparaha's niece, that was made here in the early 1920s, about 1921. And um, what had happened was an Australian film company had arrived here in 1919. They travelled around the country looking for a particular light. In those days, they needed that light to be able to... Um, the film that they used in their cameras, um, they needed a certain amount of light to, to activate the chemicals in the film, to me, to me, to me, to, to make the negative burn to capture the image. And they got to Otaki and they looked around and they said the quality of the light here is exceptional. And so they set up a company called Māori Land, Māori Land Film Company. And so, unbeknownst to me, I found all this out afterwards, I'm sitting there in the film archive in Wellington watching this film, of, and it's just a really, it's a fragment. It's one of the tonga that they have in the film archive. It's a fragment of film and it shows the, the, the tangihanga, it's a silent movie, black and white, um, people preparing kai at Roku Marae, weaving kono, um, then there's, it's broken up and then there's a, the cortege is moving down the main street here, there's six black horses with white feathers, plumage, there's a glass covered um, you know, coffin, people are walking in front and behind it. Now we still do that, we still walk down from Roku to Rangiatea, and then they turn the corner to go to Rangiatea, and then the film just burns off. And there's one end plate, which is like a credit that sits at the end of it, and it says, Town of Ōtaki, uh, the home of Māori Land film in the Los Angeles of, the, of New Zealand's moving picture industry. And when I saw that 25 years ago, that was like, that was my light bulb moment. And I stuck it on numerous fridges as I moved around the country. <laughs> and so when we looked at this building, we went, this is it. This is where we can set up, and we'll grow this to be we're going to move into making film production that can take the whole, you know, that can involve, you know, hundreds of people. Um, so we're halfway through our strategy at the moment. So we've we've gone from being a once a year event to being open 350 days of the year, uh, six seven days a week sometime, to bring um, various arts events to the to this community and also to the wider um, community because our overriding um, kaupapa is to bring economic, cultural and social uh, benefit to Wataki. And so I was able to stand on that stage in Canada 10, or 10 years ago and say, you know, we're setting up New Zealand's first Indigenous Film Festival. We would like to invite you all to come next year. Let's just be really clear that we don't have um, 
I think at that stage we had a motel and a, I think a hotel. It was really not a hotel. So I said, we don't have, we're not a town, you know. Mm. We're a small community. Um, we don't have the infrastructure you would find. We've got no nightclubs. We've got a couple of pubs where you get to meet everyone, sort of thing. But Ahako Tera, what we can absolutely offer you is our manaki. And I didn't have to explain that. I said, you know, please come and we will manaki you. And they came. And they kept on coming and they kept on coming. And, you know, it was a really beautiful thing to see my whanau look after people to the point where we were looking for filmmakers in year two going, I wonder where those filmmakers are. And they came, you know, I'll never forget it. They came tumbling out of one of our cousin's vans. She was a driver for us, you know, volunteered to be a driver. And she'd taken them round to her house for breakfast that morning, you know, gone out the night before, got some white bait and put the, um, you know, uh, the hinaki out and got a tuna. Well, they couldn't believe it. They'd never eaten anything as good as that. And they, you know, to this day, they still talk about, that's what, men, you know, that's what we've got in spades. And, and that's, to me, is why our festival took off. You know, people went, they were coming to heal. That's what they said. They got here, they met the people, they started having the conversations. And I mean, they, a lot of these filmmakers were coming, and, and not just internationals, but New Zealand filmmakers, were coming out of urban spaces where they had almost been, um, they said they came here, they felt like they were healing because of the environment and because of the people, but they actually saw themselves as indigenous people again. And that's a battle, like every day is a battle um, mm. for a lot of us to be ourselves or to be connected to that intangible, but, but very, I think, apparent when we're together. But if we're working around a lot of tauiwi, oof, the pressure, you know, sometimes it's easier to keep your head down and say nothing, hey, but this gives you a space to just go, hey, <laughs> and we already know, like, we, we're not starting at 101, you know, we're starting as, you know, the minute you, we meet Indigenous people and they say, you know, I'm from the, you know, Shani tribe, or I'm from Turtle Island, or I'm from the, you know, Ohana, uh, you know, of whichever island um, of Hawaii, we're already off. It's like, you know, let's go, let's talk. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the beautiful thing of not having to, you know, explain yourself. Just start yeah. telling each other your story. Mm. You know, it's a funny thing, because eh, uh, they, I'm the boss, <laughs> because someone has to, like, you know, break the doors down and all that sort of stuff. But without them, I couldn't do what I do because they bring the joy and they bring the reason and they bring like, you know, they do, when I know, I mean, the house is good. The fuddy is running the way the fuddy should and we're about to get into a really, really busy period and I look around and I'm like, you know, we've got 21 leaders in this fuddy and we're all on the same kaupapa because the kaupapa is in front of us. So I'm, I'm not having to be... That, you know, I'm not having to be it, but they've got me and I've got them. And, and if I was to have to do something else tomorrow, they'd be all right. They'd function. And I don't say that because I don't believe it. I actually, I've seen that happen because that's the next part of our strategy was how do we sustain our fuddy? Mm. How do we just sustain our fuddy? So I've been telling them for the last six, seven months, I will be changing tack because I'm going to go and run, I'm, I'll be here running the commercial production arm to get these films up, these big films that they can all then come into if they choose. And then we still have, so we've got Rangatahi running all of the Rangatahi projects. We've got um, animators running all of their own animation contracts, you know. Um, we've got the Hauora Ropi running the Hauora. We've got Toimataro running the artist work. Fantastic, you know, I can go and do this. But if, it, if we get this feature film off the ground, Everybody in the fuddy is going to come and work over here for, you know, uh, nine months. But the whole of Otaki could practically be working on that film almost. And wouldn't that be great? You know, I mean, that's not wouldn't that be great. That's what that's the next phase is, um, you know, to to grow commercial success that everybody will be um, able to to partake in, you know. 
So that alongside all of the other mahi that's been done in Ōtaki and our hapū, I'm really excited about the leadership. And, and, and that word is actually a tricky word. I don't think we have leadership so much here as a whole. There's a whole band of people who will enable and transform our community on our terms. You know, we, we're going to... I can see that across the... There's a big band of them now. And that's really exciting. And that's Whakatūpārana Rūmāngo in action. You know, because I know that for Peti's dad and for a lot of... Um, a generation about, you know, my dad's generation, it has relied on only some people to do all of that heavy lifting. Mm. But what I can see now is there's a whole lot more people able and willing to, to lift. And we're unashamed about that. Mm. So when I fill out all these big applications, you know, to the PGF to help us, well not to help us, to enable us uh, to refurbish the building or speak to MB or speak to anyone in government and they go, well, what do you exist for? And I said, for the cultural, social and economic benefit of Ōtaki. And they're like, oh, but wouldn't that be better if it was New Zealand? And I was like, no. <laughs> no, because you can't. We're not a venue. Ōtaki's not a venue. Ōtaki's our community. And so... If we don't do the right thing, we won't exist because, you know, we, ha we are accountable to our community and we're accountable at a level up. Our community is our wider community, but when I say community, I say I, I'm really speaking about our Māori community and our artist community mm. and then level it up and we're responsible as hapū members, so that's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> we spent maybe the last three years um, actively, um, you know, looking at the funding that fits our tikanga, has to fit our tikanga, not the other way around. Um, we've had a lot of waste of time um, conversations with, you know, those that are high up in agencies, and we and we just continue to say this is what why we elevate storytelling not as just the arts or not as just and I don't believe when I say just the arts I've never believed that's a thing anyway but a lot of the crowd that manage our resources our collective resources you know that we pay taxpayer money for really don't understand yeah. until recently until COVID hit that the arts is essential, you know, because it's the it's through the arts that you get social co cohesion. It's through the arts that you get expansion of people's experiences and shared experiences. And it's through the arts that we actually get to look at some pretty difficult, um, you know, subjects and then are able to have conversations about them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that idea that somehow the arts is a nice to have, no. Hehe theatre, or somehow the arts is like that's pretty, but you know that's not going to put food on our tables. That is so not true, and we know that as Maori and we know that as Indigenous people that if we don't tell those stories, then we lose. We're going to lose, you know, not only um, the threat of losing our matauranga, the threat of losing control of our matauranga is another whole entirely different uh, it all because that's around data sovereignty. That's around the digital age and that's around so that we've got to gear up for that and we already have you know how do we retain these things the joy of working with rangatahi is that um we're not having to decolonize them we're not having to like you know unpack a whole lot of um you know they didn't go through the same systems that i went through mm. And, and having to like always try and get in, you know, like it, was, it, it wasn't easy at all. They come in and we go, what are you interested in? Sound? Are you interested in sound? Are you the boss? Do you want to be a boss? Like as in, are you good at organising things? Can you, you know, do you draw? Do you play the game? You know, what, what, is it, what is it you're really interested in? And a lot of our rangatahi have come to us out of programmes um, that have described them as NEETS, you know, not an employment, education or tertiary study. They've fallen out of school maybe, 
they've had some issues around, um, you know, um, some social harm issues or whatever. That you know, they come with their heads down, and then it's like that, you know, the pito mata, you know, poi poi, kia puai. You know, they they do. They like transform, and now they're you know they're all busy, and they come to work, and they create amazing stuff. I'm really blown away, and I'm excited because I see how they they absolutely have uh, their own tenoranga tiratanga about how they want to tell a story. Mm. And what we do is just assist and nurture and, you know, we'll go find the money if they need the money. A lot of the stuff we make we do without the money because it's quicker and easier for us to just get on with it. But lately, it's been seen and now the industry is saying to us, how are you doing that? How are you doing that? And we were like, I have to say, we're probably doing it from the heart first mm. yeah mm. aroha and then aroha for the kaupapa and then you know the whole water that comes from that i've seen these we we put a lot of um pastoral care around them but we ask them what that looks like for them rather than just you know we we're sort of changing the way we look at each the in this whare yes there are individual individuals and some of them come from here and some of them come from as far as way as the kao in the north and you know, all over the Mutsu, but when they're in this whare, we are one whare. And we'll all look out and work out what each person needs to function, you know. So we need to replicate that, yeah. like every community. We're not, um, we get, we're, we're getting more and more people coming to us and saying, how do we do what you're doing? Mm. And we're like, get on our website and have a look. Because it's all there, all the strategies, the rangatahi strategies there, um, festival strategies there, the whole order strategy, all the strategies are up there. This is what we did, this is the story, this is how we, you know. And, and we don't have a, um, we're not like this about what we do, um, because, but at the same time, in order for this to work anywhere, they, I, I think you must understand where you're standing and who you're standing with and which community you um or you know, because it has to be in your community mm. and not placed on. You know, it has to. I, that's what I think. So, yeah. If you look at the history of you of the human race, you know. Conquest and colonization, um, this current world that we live in, which is about um, aspiring to have things. So, you know, we're all in this system that that is constantly messaging that we need this, 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 and we need, you know, we need these as individuals rather than the, than the collective, is what, get, what leads us into the current climate that we have where people are suffering and it's the arts when we see stories that are familiar to us and they may be from um, you know Canada or the States or we see absolutely see the harm that colonization continues to have and in some ways we can watch those and it's just far enough removed from our own hurt and our own mm -hmm. mummy to be able to go it's happening everywhere and it activates us. It activates us to go, no, that's not acceptable. Because we're so um, bombarded by the broadcast media that actually doesn't tell our story or allow us to tell our story or show us, like a mirror, what's actually going on. Mm. Because news polarizes. You know, news polarizes. We've learned to distrust news. Which is a, which I have a you know that's a shame because there is some good journalism but we've learnt to kind of you know so we ha we, we we're turning inwards back to our community and I think you know the next part of our strategy is when, with the storytelling that we're doing is you know it's not all doom and gloom there's actually celebration and all of the things that we do there's you know the fourth power of our fari oho oho to inspire to be ready. Um, core core to celebrate because you know right now we've never needed more celebration to to be able to like you know again negate some of the harm that's happening 
to ourselves and our whānau. Um, ko tahi tanga, you know, to, to, to think and act and be collective because that's our, that's our superpower as Indigenous peoples. Um, and, you know, the last one is all about, you know, Manaki is all about wrapping all of that up in whole water. Really? So those are so the fuddy is a storytelling fuddy, an artist fuddy, but it also has the whole order aspect. Um, from the front to the back, back to the front. So we have our Marakai, we have our Kai Collective. Those are you know, us um, giving back to our community. Mm. We were really quite surprised by um, our Pakia, our Tawiwi audience. Because initially I was like, oh, where are all the Māori? I want all the Māori in the front row. <laughs> and when I looked at the front row, it was all our nannies and our kaumatua, so that was great. <laughs> but then I was like, all well, the frosty tops, we call them, were there, you know. My mum's a frosty top, so I'm allowed to say that. But, you know, and then started listening to what they were saying. And they were like, it was like a penny drop for them. They were watching films and crying about um, stolen and um, murdered women in Canada. Uh, which is a, you know continues to happen, and going, oh, could, is that happening here? And then we were having people speak about being stolen children from the state and being in state care. Mm. And the next thing I was looking around, and the filmmakers that were telling these stories about you know this this harder that had happened to them, we're having conversations with um, Pakeha audiences, and then it was like. You know, they were starting to see our side of the story in a way that, you know, some of these stories are funny and some of these stories are quirky and some of them are, you know... Um, but the thing is, we're playing in all the genres. Indigenous film is playing in all the genres mm. and playing in all the different tropes and all the rest of it. But it was almost like, you know, that seeing our treaty partner understand what we were trying to say rather than having it... Um, you know, there's been some really good work in documentary land but they're not watching that. But they're watching drama. They're watching, so we, we call it subverting the masses. <laughs> you know, telling our stories for ourselves and to ourselves, but at the same time subverting people to our cause. Yeah, so when I first made um, stuff for TV3 and TVNZ back in the day, it was very difficult to get a Māori, a kaupapa Māori story funded for mainstream really mm. tricky so we used to dress them up and call them like the truth about Māori you know all Māori can sing mm. all Māori can play the guitar, the yeah. guitar all that sort of stuff and, and they were funny because we'd get the funny people like the you know the Peels and the Oscars and the you know to tell their stories or the, the silly whatever but we're actually telling a really serious message in, behind there you mm. know breaking down some of those stereotypes so we, you know, we, we serve every opportunity to get our stories up there and, and then, you know, they don't know it, but they're being subverted. I mean, like, it's in the bag. You just go, it's a game show. Yeah, but we did it in like, bilingually and we went to 72 towns. And a lot of those towns are really, really backward in terms of their treaty relationships. So we would fill their little town hall with Māori and Pākehā. Well, you know, they'd come because they were coming to see It's in the Bag. And then Pio and Stacey would get up on stage and, like, you know, do their... Stace would just, you know, whatever mihi she wanted to pull that night. And honestly, I could see all the park here in the room go, oh, no. <laughs> But then Pio would come on and, and we would we'd have them, you know. We'd have them. And then we would teach them something they never even thought about themselves, you know. So, yeah, it's always been that. It's, um, you know, when people say the power of the media, it's true. The media has power. The media has absolute, it absolutely has power because knowledge is power and message is power. And so if we grab that back. I'm not normally somebody who's about prohibition or about, um, you know, but for me, I think that gambling has been and continues to be one of the colonizer's tools and it's well it's wielded in a very underhanded way it's dressed up as dreams and it's dressed up as um you know a solution and it's not a solution and our whanau are, are aware they're really aware we have a 
you know, here in Otaki, we have the Otaki Māori Racing Club legacy. And, and as far as I'm aware, that came down to being expert around horse, horses and horsemanship. And it came at a time when, again, a strategy, I think, of our, of our, of our um, kaumātua kuia then, you know, they were wise to how to get into clubs because in clubs, that's where you influence decision makers. But our people were also landed gentry. They owned a lot of land, a lot of whenua back in those days. So I don't think, you know, if we look at our own legacy, that you can say, oh, well, you know, Mark, we've always been gambling. No, we have not always been gambling. Horses, training horses, owning a race course is not the same as buying a lotto ticket or going and playing on the gaming machines. And our whanau, you know, they become addicted to these things because... I think because they, the alternative of actually realising that, you know, our community is changing and there's a space for them. Maybe they, that message hasn't got through, but I, I would not be opposed at all to having them outright gambling, outright banned, because I think, um, yeah, I, I see it's becoming more and more insidious, and especially as... Um, people are really feeling uh, the pressure, whānau are really feeling the pressure, you know, the ads that come on TV around, you know, the lotto and how much, you know, how much is actually spent on advertising the lotto as some sort of family-friendly activity? I don't think so, you know, so... But that's not, that's not just for Māori either, that's for, you know, Pākehā. I mean, what are the odds these days? No one mm. ever talks about, you know, where are the statistics that show how much a normal household spends on... And, and, you know, I think it's possible because we've done the same with smoking, you know. Who would have thought that we would be, um, you know, advertising for cigarettes wasn't a, isn't uh, now a legal thing or, you know, going to the dairy and not being able to see them. I mean, I still find that very strange, but we can make change. Mm. And I think that the time to review Lotto, especially, um, and, you know, those pokey machines need to, uh, you know... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they need to go. <laughs>
you know, this idea that we would go to the paparakota, to the pub, to catch up with each other. I mean, that, that's not such a thing anymore. That's not really the thing we do, unless it's a special occasion in a small town like Ōtaki, you know. So I can imagine how you can kind of drift into this space where they've got all those machines and this idea that you might be a winner, you know. <laughs> but that comes down to disconnection and being possibly being bored or lonely or you, uh, you think you're lonely. So this idea that we can expand um, our horizons, you know, that's, I think that there's a lot in that. So giving them opportunity to go and see something, to do something different. You know, in small towns, you know, that's often not a thing. So that's why at the hub, you know, we, at Māori Land, you know, with COVID, just before COVID, we had a whole lot of gigs almost on a weekly basis, and we're going back to that. So, you know, starting with the, the Matariki Ramaro Festival, you know, we're bringing back those gigs, we're bringing back those opportunities, we're making them affordable. Um, we're saying, come on, if you're curious, come in the door, have a look, and, you know, um, yeah, you know, getting them out of the pubs or getting them out of the spaces that, you know, they're possibly quite bored with now. <laughs> <laughs>